Hi, welcome to Numerics Video Blog. I'm your host, Jim Jockel. Joining me today is Director of Research, Paul Rawadi of Alpha Cution Research. Welcome, Paul. Good to be here, Jim. So, I want to sit down and talk about a recent report um, on digital transformation, clues to shifting financial services technology, part one. So, I think one first thing we have to do is give us your definition of what is digital transformation in financial services. Yeah, I think we get caught up in the fintech part of the transformation is really exciting because we get to talk about a lot of new sexy buzzwords like blockchain and um, cloud and Internet of Things and many, many others, the uh, mobile payments. There's just a whole ecosystem of new buzzwords. But what I've been focusing on in this research is larger enterprises big buyers of solutions and technologies in the financial services ecosystem that have a lot of bodies, have a lot of businesses, and their transformation is a lot more process oriented. And that's a different kind of transformation in terms of how do you re-engineer workflows so that you have the optimal amount of bodies, the op optimal mix of skills that are operating on that workflow. And that's I, I don't, that's the less sexy aspect of the innovation, but I think it's the bigger impact of the innovation that's going on. You know, that reminds me, a couple of years ago, uh, you were uh, running a, a conference panel discussion, and it was with uh, the former head of uh, CTO of UBS. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that really stood out for me in that conversation was 90% of my time is managing legacy systems, but if the remaining 5% is if I could look at business process and give all of my users 10, 10 minutes back per day, right. then I'm doing a good job. Exactly, exactly. It's those kinds of metrics that I think bring into focus the magnitude of the value when you start the journey of optimizing or improving a process that involves so many bodies, so much time, which is, I mean, the biggest piece of the spend here is the human capital piece. So how do you get, how do you begin to optimize, maximize the output of your team? And that's where a lot of the foundational technology, certainly infrastructure as a service, is one of those uh, developments, and I mean cloud and public cloud and private cloud and all the hybridization, that falls underneath this umbrella of infrastructure as a service, which has dramatic impacts not only on the technology teams to deploy that kind of capability, but also the end users in the time it takes to get what you need. So I, are you now saying as we go into 2016, the, the cloud argument and, and anti-cloud sentiment in financial services is dead. I think it's pretty much dead. I mean, I think that the argument that, well, you know, if we look a year ago and prior when the cloud discussion first came about, security issues was the major impediment to adopting some of the big horizontal, you know, the AWSs of the world, right? And the argument that is coming out of that is that, well, we specialize in this stuff. Our security is going to be at least as good as your security because this is not what you do. Um, and so it seems that the adoption, certainly the adoption by new entrants that are threatening to disintermediate some of the pieces of this financial services spectrum, is one reason why the incumbents have to get on that train. The other thing is the cost and the, and the, the ratio of more for less. Mm -hmm. And I think just the level of, of, of adoption has gotten to a tipping point, not only from the incumbents, from, from the success of the new entrants, that that argument is pretty much dead for what seems to be a majority of the compute or a major, majority of the workflows. Mm -hmm. Nobody is saying that all the workflows are going into the public cloud. I think there, there will be a portion that are just so ultra sensitive that you just want to keep it in, in a more private scenario, even if it's not in your own data center. But I think your, your hypothesis that it's dead or just about dead is, is pretty accurate. And that's going to fuel a new trajectory, if you will, in adoption going into 2016. So let's talk about the trajectory. Where do you start? KYC, Basel III, SIM, MIFID, the, the, the startup invasion, uh, a challenging core banking systems on the retail side or loans, or, where does an institution start? 
I think that the prioritization has to be in responding to the regulatory needs. It's, it's not to say that it isn't important to be paying attention to new entrants and where they might be disintermediating some of the business, but the reality is, is the bark is bigger than the bite, right? It's important to pay attention to what they're actually doing, but the economic threat of that in the short term is much different than the economic threat of not complying with a whole spectrum of rules. Now, ideally, responding to these rules, if you are paying close enough attention to how you organize data, how you collect data, how you save and store data, then you're really answering many of these different alphabet soup of regulations simultaneously, as opposed to, well, I'm just going to do this, this report by collecting these, this list of metadata items, and then I'm going to do this rule and collect those, that list of uh, metadata items. If you have a more enterprise-sensible, more enterprise-centric data management strategy, then the metadata items that are necessary to satisfy this rule and that rule and that rule are essentially all being organized simultaneously. Now, of course, that's easier said than done, and these are very, very dispersed and diverse and decentralized and siloed still organizations. So, you know, the reality and, and the objective are still certainly not in the same place. So is it a, is it a fair assumption to 2016 and beyond that a financial institution needs to be an IT company as much as it is a provider of services? Yeah, I don't know if I would go quite that far. I mean, certainly there are leaders in our space that are claiming that they're an IT company, and I think that there is some logic to that. Certainly if you have a culture and you have a history uh, developing um, quite a bit of your own, you have proprietary footprint, then you have somewhat of the luxury of staying on that track, so to speak. But if you don't have that culture of proprietary development where the pieces fit together more easily, then I think that it's difficult to just become that, right? If you are uh, a large financial institution that is, has a culture where you are bolting pieces together, you kind of have to stay on that road. So some of the players will be able to claim the technology mantra and, and you know, wear that banner, and others will have to have a different messaging where maybe they are, you know, managed services certainly is a big piece of this. Maybe there are pieces of the stack that are sufficiently democratized or commoditized that can be outsourced or, or uh, partnered. And then what I think happens is that the special sauce rises higher in the proverbial stack. In other words, where the technology and where the creativity needs to occur is in the so-called information design that we were talking about mm -hmm. a minute ago, yeah. where they really have to uh, design how their clients interact with their services and internally how their workflows are managed with this much more sophisticated you know, we've called it in the past an exploration layer is in addition to a, a presentation layer. Well, it might be an interesting uh, piece of research for uh, if you were to categorize some of these institutions, right? And because I think we've seen such a shift of, of you know, the custodians are going to kind of move into this business and then some retraction, um, you know, the you know changes in some of the investment banks moving out of investment banking or, or, or scaling down trading operations um, and focus on wealth management, you know. So it might be interesting to see you know how that's what that puzzle is going to look like and kind of project in the next few years so some of the early work that we're doing is is trying to create some new lenses to solve that puzzle or to see those pieces and I think already just in the first phase of modeling that we've done on the largest buyers of technology in the space which are the largest global banks that their spending patterns, the, the, the banks that have more volatility in their spending pattern using a metric, a couple of metrics that, uh, one being revenue per employee and another being technology spending per employee, the volatility of those metrics suggests uh, a level of capability. There are firms who are leaders who have very low volatility of spending, which is quite miraculous when you consider the volatility of the underlying landscape over the last 10 years. 
whereas other organizations have extreme volatility in their spending patterns, which suggest that they don't have the continuity, they may not have the culture, they may not, they, they may not have the management continuity that allows them to develop in the way that the new digital era requires them. So I don't think that everybody can be a leader. I think that there are leaders who will perpetuate their leadership. Some new ones will, en will enter those ranks and others will continue to follow to the best of their ability. And what about, um, uh, we're also seeing a trend now of uh, a lot of institutions setting up innovation labs in right. terms of funding uh, some of, I think, uh, the number out there, there was 380 startups globally now kind of spread out between um, Silicon Valley, London, um, as well as Singapore just in the last year that have received VC funding. Um, and a percentage of that is from some of the banks themselves, like a Deutsche Bank or folks like that. What is the anticipation of that technology that the banks themselves are investing in for financial services gets incorporated into the, the overall institution's ecosystem? Well, well, I would go back to the beginning of why it's set up that way. I think that, and this is you know, something that I'm trying to do with our new business model is a lot of times, and this is borne out in prior you know, research from a year or two ago, where when you look at the biggest impediments to transformation, digital or otherwise, pedestrian transformation or just typical change, that it's not the adoption of the new tech or the new software or the new data it's the political inertia that gets in the way, roughly speaking. So one of the strategies, and this is where Silicon Valley, I think, has played a role and where the venture teams, whether they be inside a, a, a traditional financial services company, a bank, or they've been purely a venture firm, is that sometimes you need to set up a blank slate, a clean Petri dish where something can germinate and grow to the point where it's mature enough to be replanted inside a politically toxic organization as opposed to trying to do it inside the organization as it exists now. Hmm. And I think if you look at, you know, over time that this is a common strategy that things tend to fail inside organizations that have other objectives. There are teams in place inside a larger organization that don't want that innovation to succeed because it threatens their job or it threatens their promotion or it threatens their budget. So the fact that you see many of the large incumbents setting up innovation labs that are technically outside is really a way to protect those innovations from this so-called political toxicity, cultural dysfunction, just normal stuff even. Um, and so now, do we have too many? Maybe everybody's you know jumping on that bandwagon. Everything's not going to succeed. But the strategy to protect innovation, I think, is what is notable and in, in what you've observed. Well, Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. The report, Digital Transformation, Clues to Shifting Financial Service Technology for Alpha Cushion Research. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here, Jim. And of course, the website is alphacution.com, and you can follow Paul on LinkedIn, uh, as well as Numerics. And of course, we want to talk about the things that you you want to talk about, please follow us on Twitter at NX Analytics. Are you on Twitter? Yeah, at Alphacution. At Alphacution. Thank you so much, Paul. We'll see Thanks. you next time.